Hello, my name is Myron Samuels. The Intercollegiate Athletic Department at Iowa State University is proud to sponsor this panel discussion on the black student athlete. We have assembled a panel of former student athletes who have first-hand experience with Iowa State, and for the next few minutes, we will talk about those things that may be necessary for all student athletes to be successful, quote unquote, both on and off the playing fields. At this time, allow me to introduce the panel. To my far right, we have Troy Franklin. Troy is a graduate student pursuing a doctoral degree in higher education. Troy is a two-sport athlete from Langston University. Troy will offer for this discussion a perspective from the Black College. To my immediate right, we have Alexia Anderson. Alexia is a four-year letter winner in track and field. And Alexia also was a student representative on ISU Athletic Council. Alexia is from Pleasant Valley, Iowa. To my immediate left, we have Vanessa Ward from Miami, Florida. Vanessa is a former four-year letter winner in basketball. Vanessa was recognized as the All Big Eight academic uh, recognition. Next to Vanessa is Hughes Suffering. Hughes is a graduate student pursuing a master's degree in higher education. Hughes is a former two-sport athlete here at Iowa State, participating in both football and basketball. Next to Hughes is Matt Goodwin. Matt is from Ames, Iowa. Matt is currently a member of the Cyclone football team and president of the Black Student Government Association. Hugh, you responded yes to the question the, that the black athlete is being exploited at predominantly white colleges and universities. As a college administrator, the, I take a defensive spot, posture on that. What do you mean by exploitation, and in what ways do you think that the black athlete is being exploited? Okay, I, I guess the first thing I should do is uh, give a dictionary definition of exploitation, and it's an unjust or improper use of another person for one's own, own profit or advantage. Now using that definition, I can come up with hundreds, and literally hundreds of examples of ways that black student athletes are being exploited on campuses across the country. However, what I'll do is cite one so you'll know exactly where I'm going with the word exploitation. Um, I read in um, Black Issues in Higher Education, the periodical, uh, that of 20 black student athletes that played on Memphis State's men's basketball team between the years of 1976 and 1986, only one graduated. Of 20, only one graduated. At North Carolina State's program, only two graduated in a similar 10-year span. So I'm not trying to really say that all universities are practicing exploitation, but we have to keep in mind that black student athletes are a very big part, really the backbone of, of these programs that are generating millions and millions of dollars each year, and yet we're only graduating 30% of them. Okay, if I, if I hear Hughes correct, Vanessa, he's talking primarily about those revenue generating sports, uh, i.e. men's basketball and football. What do you think about the question, the black athlete uh, being exploited, expounded if you will, and if you could give me a woman's perspective on that question. Is the woman, does the black woman experience something different uh, than what men go through? Okay, I'd like to start off by saying that um, I agree that students, black student athletes are exploited, but I believe that only because when they come into a system, they have no idea what's gonna take place. The administrators, the staff, and all of those involved in a student athlete's career they know what's going to happen in those four five years if they don't inform the student athlete what is going to take place or what they think might happen then yes they're being they're being exploited because they aren't aware of what's going to happen i think that they aren't being exploited because they have to find ways of finding those things out coming into iowa state as a freshman you have no idea what's going to happen after your freshman year, you're used to things. You should be on your way to finding out things. And if something happens to you, then that means you had a hand in it because I don't think you have to go along with anything you don't agree with. So the first year, I think, yes, they're being exploited because they aren't aware of what's, what's happening. But after that, I believe that they have a hand in that. 
Okay. You talked about things happening and what's going mm -hmm. on. Help, help me, Alexia, um, talk about what happens and what things go, goes on as an incoming freshman uh, as far as avoiding the pitfalls that may take place. Well, basically, when you first come here, you have to realize what your goals are. You have to um, decide what you're going to major in. A lot of the times freshmen come in here, they don't have the slightest idea what they're going to major in. Of course, the um, academic counselors, they automatically just put you in whatever, whatever classes, and most of them are elective classes, so they spend a year just um, spending most of their time with just electives. So that sets them back a year. It all is based on like what Vanessa was saying. That first year is, it does take a lot of adjustment, but if you have goals, if you know what you want to major in, and if you um, set yourself um, into time management, then you shouldn't have that many problems. And it's all based on individual responsibility. Okay. Troy, I want to bring you into this because you're here and you, want, you will offer to us a black college perspective. Now, the literature suggests that the black colleges historically has done a better job with student athletes as far as graduation rates are concerned. How do you see the black college experience in comparison to what you are now studying, as well as the Iowa State experience that you now here working with the academic counseling services, et cetera? Help us out a little bit. Well, first of all, Myron, uh, I guess the biggest thing it would be that most of the black colleges, uh, well, particularly all of them, have a nurturing environment. Uh, you often hear that uh, Iowa State or predominantly white institution uh, may be lacking in black role models or minority role models. That's not the case at a black institution. And you have to realize, too, that being smaller, uh, a smaller liberal arts school will have a more of a teaching emphasis. So they're going to be more concerned about the athlete's uh, commitment outside the classroom as well. So I, I think it would all, if I could sum it up, it would have to be that caring factor that they really do care because they can relate. These professors, many, many of them are black, have been through some of the same experiences as many of those athletes, so they understand it a little bit better. Okay. Mag, let me bring you into this because we are talking basically from past experience. All of these uh, guys have, and girls have finished their playing days. You are still currently going through that. You are a current member of the uh, Cyclone football team. How do you see things changing, or have they changed since the days Hughes have gone through them? And just generally, what are your perspective? And uh, share with us, if you will, the success or the means of ways that you have been successful going through the, the process. Well, um, uh, well, I can relate to, to Hughes, because I know they, they went through a lot of stuff. You know, he was on the football team, and I talked to him about what he went through, so I do know somewhat what they went through. But when I was when I came here as a freshman, I would have to say that, you know, going to a college, there's a lot of things thrown at you. You're thrown into a different environment. But uh, going to a college being a student athlete, you know, you have to deal with practices, you know, that, that you didn't experience in high school. There's more film sessions, more, a lot more vigorous activity, you know, and you're always, you know, separated with the football team. And, uh, uh, and when you come here, you kind of, sometimes you might lose sight of that you can to college to get an education because when we come here as freshman football players, you know, it's the season. And the goal of everybody there, coaches, players alike, is to win games. And, um, you know, that's a good goal in the season, but we can't forget that, uh, you know, we came there for education and stuff. And I think that is a problem because uh, when you come there, you're, you're a freshman, you got recruited for football, you want to go up there and play football and do good. And there seems sometimes not to be anybody there to remind you that you're there for school. Okay. And I think that's what needs to be in place. Well, let me to elaborate a little bit on what Matt said. Um, both both of you two are like talking about basketball and football. Um, for the lower revenue, like for me, track, um, I feel that it's a much higher graduation rate, and um, a lot of the coaches are less stressed on just competing and just um, going to practice and all that. Like. For instance, my coach, she was very supportive. I mean, in fact, if I had um, a test the next day, he wouldn't expect you to be at practice. You know, if you had something to do that you had to get done, they wouldn't expect you to be at practice. But as it, like for basketball, my boyfriend was on the basketball team, he could never miss a practice. No matter how much work he had to do, no matter what, there was no, uh, um, there was no exception. You could never miss a practice. And I think the coaches just have to realize that school does come first, and most of the coaches don't. Vanessa, Let's open up the Iowa State experience. How was it when you came here 
from Miami, Florida, a long way from home, different climate, um, different culture uh, makeup, different demographics, et cetera. What are the things that, you know, the, threw you a curveball, and how were you able to avoid the pitfalls? Okay, as far as the university experience goes, I was throwing a lot of curveballs. But in my experience from coming from Miami, I was strong enough and I guess stubborn enough not to fall into them. Okay. They were presented to me. Be specific, if you will, uh, about pitfalls. What, when we say pitfalls, help me define what pitfalls mean. Okay, um, like a year down the road from when you come into Iowa State University, you find out that you might not be eligible because your classes aren't towards your degree and you find yourself taking a whole bunch of classes during the summer. Mm -hmm. I've, from um, my experience compared to other um, black students' experiences that are on the teams, the basketball team now, they, they fell into all of those because they didn't, I don't know what it is, is I think that they didn't, um, they just didn't inquire enough about what was, why they were doing this now, because now was more important to them. And now wasn't important to me back then. Four years from then was important. And I always had graduation in sight because I knew that was why I was here. But there were people that come out of high school that basketball are more important. And I'm not saying that's wrong, it's just that's their priority. Mine happened to be getting an education and I think that's what kept me from falling out of that because I wouldn't settle for anything they told me. I mean, I took their advice and I used it to my advantage, but I questioned it. Okay. I questioned it then and I'll question it now. Why am I doing this? Is it gonna help me? How, it, how is it gonna help me? And I don't think students, 17 and 18 year olds, we don't really learn that. We learn to respect, you know, people in higher positions. And that's what we do as athletes coming in, and that's our fall. Okay. That's our pitfall. Troy, come in here and talk, if you will. You are doing some work with Steve McDonald in the academic service department. How do you deal with these students who come in and may not have the focus or may not see the one or two year priority that Vanessa is alluding to and just have basketball, basketball? And we know from the literature that, you know, that is a, a problem dealing with the black male in those sports of men's basketball and football. How do counselors deal with that or what do you offer? Well, I'll get a little, uh, little background about it, Byron. It's, it's not an easy one because you, you go back to the high schools where it's amazing you can see a gym packed full of people at a ball game, but you see two parents, black parents at a PTA meeting. It's values. These students, uh, they don't have a number of role models coming up. They see a Michael Jordan or a Bo Jackson. And, uh, and particularly since the sports they're getting into, will, they'll have an opportunity to play professionally. So when the only, time, only role models you have all your life is sports athletes, you c it's difficult to take their focus away from sports. That's all they want to do. But so our role, I guess, you know, working with Steve and uh, a number of academic support services, is to help them take some type of ownership and to see down the line, hey, my sports career is gonna end one day and I have to prepare and take advantage of this scholarship and not let it take advantage of me. And, and like Hugh said, they need people and role models specifically that have been down that road and they need to see that people care. But it's an ongoing struggle. I mean, you can't, I don't think it's fair to take away a person's dream. If they wanna play pro ball, that is fine. But we have to instill in them that, hey, you know, you have to come here and, and education is going to be important for you to survive. Okay. And I right. think that we have to tell them that just playing basketball won't get them there. And that's what some of the coaches, they do that. They, they talk basketball, basketball, basketball. These are the steps you have to take to get to that point. But they never in, entwine um, academics with and sports. They never, they never, they never meet. Why? Okay. It's either you do this or you do that or you don't do any of it. And you're going to do something because you, you have a dream of playing basketball. You're going to do what it takes to get there. Just like if you have a goal to graduate, you will. Okay. Matt, right. you're, you're, exper you're benefiting from the advice of your, your peers and, and these are your role models whether you recognize them or not. Tell us, if you will, as best you can share with us, what is the talk among uh, the teammates in the locker room or uh, at the training table. What are they talking about? And if those uh, individuals may be talking about a professional career, 
how does the conversation comes into play about men there's some other things that are important uh, and share if you can how is that different from female athletes well talk in the locker room well basically from eight to five or eight to whenever your class get out you're you know basically with class and you're focusing all your concentration on that but when you're at practice you're at practice and there's not I don't think there's too much conversation going on about academics anytime you're in the athletic facilities including training table then then maybe after part-time I don't think athletes like Vanessa said even contemplate what's gonna happen later in life you know maybe like when they're close to graduation three you know their third year their junior year then you know if they figure out you know maybe I don't have a shot at the pro career you know what I'm what am I gonna do you know but if they the whole time they go through there thinking they're gonna play pro or whatever they think you know they can go Canadian or whatever they think that you know it's too late for them they're already gone when they finally think about you know what's what's gonna happen with their life in, in their later life uh, but I think that if there's like you know I, I found in you a positive role model cuz I mean you're involved with the athletic but but the business part of it you know and maybe if you know we had some people come down and talk to the football team about you know you know if I'm a business major if the football team you know brought in somebody you know from a business you know maybe a, a black person or or it could be a, a white person it doesn't really matter as long as somebody came in and said you know well you're a business major and you know this is what you can do and you know you can have the nice cars and the nice things and you know the family and all that you don't have to go out and beat up your body for it and you know if, is this something you want to do and you know if not you know why is your major business and you know you get done with football when you're 25 you know you have that rest of your life to do something you know with it and you know if your major is business you know let's get you going on business but there's not anybody to do it okay. and all the student athletes are thinking the same thing a lot. Here of you want to make a comment but I want to I want to throw this at you within your comments you had the dream of playing professional sports. I don't know this, I'm assuming. Uh, one of the two sports that you played. You came here as a participant in two sports. You graduated. You're now a graduate student. Tell us about your transition, the process you went through, looking for my dreams, playing both football and basketball, but then finally say, hey, I have to get my degree as well, and now I'm looking for bigger and better things. Well, I had role models. So when I when I was I grew up with you know in a two parent family, um, and I had positive role models all around me. I'm with a cl close knit family, you know, and there's a lot of us. So when I came here, I I felt strong and I knew where I was going. I had goals. I knew what direction I was headed in. Even though I liked football and that's really what I wanted to do, I knew I was going to get a degree. Now I almost slipped and fell into one of those pitfalls Vanessa was talking about, in that. Uh, so many of us do after that first year we're fighting to stay eligible you know I, I went through the summer uh, well actually after the fall semester I had a point something something grade point average and I'm, I'm now fighting to to get back on track and I think a lot of that is you got to take it upon yourself to go to class you got to go to class well first of all you got to you got to know how to pick your friends you got to know how to pick your friends, because if your friends aren't studying, you're not going to be studying, for one. Okay, you got to go to class. See, and being a, going to class is not enough. You got to be there and be there on time. You know, because you, you're stereotyped when you hit the door. When you hit the classroom door, you're stereotyped. So you got to overcome all kind of obstacles. So be there and be on time. Um, you've got to know more than just the football team. You got to know more. You got to venture out a, into the mainstream of the population of of the university and get to know some other people and that way you can you know you won't feel so isolated because isolation is a big problem when you, when you come in when the only person that you can really talk to is the person that brought you here and that's your coach you know and, and that's wrong so um, I didn't really fall into I guess the nor what everybody else is falling into because I always had you know people around me that I knew I, I knew a couple of people before I came here so so you put a whole, you put a, a strong emphasis on time management oh, or, uh, and balancing those things between the practice yeah. commitment and restraints uh, and being able to go to class. Definitely. And if I could, I'd like to give you a normal day, you know, just off the top of my head, a normal uh, day for football for me when I got here. And it, this is a new coaching staff here now. But when I got here, um, a normal day would be wake up, go to class from 8 to 2. 
you had to be down at the, the stadium at 2.15 for films until 3.15. What do you mean go to class from 8 to 2? Suppose my we, class was at 3, 3.30. You couldn't take it during the season. You couldn't take it during the season. Well, which, who? Not, if, not, if, not if you were on the traveling squad, you couldn't take it during the season. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you could, but you wouldn't play. I mean, they kind of made that clear. So then you got from 3 to 5, you know, 3.15 is films, and then you had to be on the field at 3.30, right? And you had to get taped and all that by 3.30. Okay, 6.15, 6.30, maybe practice is over, but you haven't lifted weights yet. So sometime between 8 and 2 and 6.30 and 7, you have to lift weights. And then you got to get the training table before it closes. Training, class, uh, training table closes 7.30, 8 o'clock, and then you have study table from 8 to 10, and then you start this all over again. Now, you, you realize that I haven't even mentioned the social life, and then once you throw that in, then something's going to suffer. Either your, 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 uh, your athletics or your academics is going to suffer. Okay. So, that's, so that's time management is really important. Okay. What, is, what does the literature say that is happening across the country? as far as the student instructor relationship at predominantly white colleges and universities? Well, obviously, you know, when you're at a large institution, Myron, the focus is going to be research. And there's not a lot of uh, opportunities to engage in dialogue, particularly because if, if they're not tenured, they're shooting for tenure. And their focus is research. I many of you have experienced being in the classroom with two, three hundred students. They're standing up there. Uh, there's no opportunity to collaborate with other class members because you're busy taking notes. So all of you and well, all of us have experienced that, but the faculty seems to be less connected with the student. And it seems to contradict the student development purpose. I mean, we're supposed to have this holistic point of view where we're concerned about developing the total student. But it, it, it amazes me that uh, during the season, before this ad hoc committee report came out, many of you probably have heard about it, uh, the faculty members had nothing to say. But when that came out in the report, they wanted to make all the decisions. And I just, I don't think that's fair. They're being very reactive instead of being proactive with the situation. Okay. Uh, Matt, you want to speak? I think that, uh, that when you're talking about the student instructor relationship, I think it goes back a little farther to when you first come here and your advisor and everything. Because, you know, when I first talked to my advisor, you know, I, you know, I talked to him about, you know, what I, you know, I became here as a business major, or actually a poli sci major. And, um, you know, I talked to him about what I wanted to take and what I wanted to be and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I think, like, when I first, I talked to two different instructors, uh, advisors. The first one was like, I think he looked at me as a black student athlete. And, uh, you know, my schedule was handed to me. You know, I didn't, it was handed to me. Just, here you go. This is what you need to take, you know, because, you know, you have football and, you know, other stuff. You know, and then I was, you know, I, I went back and talked to my mom. And, you know, she told me, you know, Matt, this isn't the right schedule for you. And so I went back, I talked to another advisor. You know, she, she saw that I was from Ames, you know, a good school system. My ACT was good. I told him I came here on academic scholarship, not athletic. And my schedule changed, just totally. And, you know, so I went, you know, that's the first experience I had from Iowa State. So then, from the get-go, I knew I had to watch what I was doing. Now, some other students, you know, or student athletes, they come here, and like Vanessa said, they trust them and that sort of thing, and they went back with that pity pass schedule that they originally gave me, you know, and, and I think the expectations of success or failure on, you know, on the black student athlete is measured totally different, and especially when you're talking about coming here for one or two years, you know, they think that's okay for the black student athlete, but I'm pretty sure they don't have that view about the white student athlete, you know, that's just my personal perception of that, you know, I don't think they say, you know, well, they can come here for one or two years and go back to wherever they're from, you know, but since your black student athletes come from an inner city school or whatever, they are better off one or two years than nothing. And that's, that's just not right either. Let, let me throw this out, and any one of you can jump and run with it. What do you think that we as college administrators or athletic administrators can do more of, or what do you think is missing from a total uh, support service? Uh, here again, uh, what do you think we can do better? Uh, as far as to making sure that our success ratio for the black student athlete improves? I, th I think one thing that's necessary is uh, a mentoring program because once these, w if we can get these student athletes here and get a imp uh, uh, implement a mentoring program right off, someone that they can hook up to, whether it's just a big brother system with, an, uh, with an, an, a successful athlete, 
you know, or it can be a faculty mentoring program where they're t uh, showing them the ropes. I think that's necessary. That way, those pitfalls, you know, they won't fall into them because somebody can say, well, this is the person you can talk to for this, or this is the person you can talk to. And they'll always be, you know, directed in the right direction, you know. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that's important for the faculty to remember is that each person that comes through Iowa State is an individual and just because they are black and on the football, basketball, track or what have you that their experiences are different. So you can't just give Matt a schedule and expect him to follow it because as a person you didn't even get to know him. You don't know if he has dedication, the dedication it takes you know to get a degree you don't know any of that just because you see that black football player down there on that paper doesn't mean you can go to a computer which generalizes everything and expect Matt to comply with that you have to treat us as individuals and then I think the next step is honesty just straight up honesty I mean what's to hide is there something they're hiding from us why don't they tell us everything when we come in so we can be prepared for whatever's going to happen next? I agree, too, with both of you all, because uh, what, what I feel, Myron, is that there needs to be more collaboration between faculty and student support services. It, it, yes. I don't know if there's animosity. Being on the inside, you can see that there's, that's lacking. And I think the institution needs to re-examine its focus, particularly on its um, delivery services. Uh, it's a shame that... Uh, there has to be so much duplication, particularly with the study table and things where there's support services set up. You're talking now the athletic department and the general student right. support services. Exactly, okay. because uh, like I mentioned earlier that this institution runs from eight to five. Uh, why don't, not just for the athletes, but they could offer services for the adult students. I mean, and, and other students that may need special needs. And I think we need to get away from this separatism idea and start, there needs to be more and we need to integrate the students into the general body somehow. In every, every situation we get an opportunity to do that, we need to do it because we're, uh, it's like we're just a separate entity. I mean, the athletes are here, the students here, and the only time they get to see them is doing an athletic event or, oh gosh, I got such and such in class, and they never respect them other than an athlete. It's just, oh, they talk about sports, how you doing, how many points you hit, yeah. but they're not concerned exactly. about them as an individual. Okay, you, tell, you, mentioned, you mentioned a point, and let's, let's bring that up. The students here, the athletes here. Matt, start us off on, on this. How is it living in Ames, and what do you see the guys, talk, the guys or girls, your, your peers, talking about coming into the Ames community? Well, uh, when, I, when I came to Iowa State, I didn't foresee myself as, quote, unquote, a student athlete. I came here as a student, basically. You know, and football was something I wanted to do. So when I talked amongst my graduating class from high school, I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, we all talked about the same things, you know. And then my partner that came up right behind me, you know, I, I tried to get him straight as much as possible, you know, to come in here and, you know, I came in here and I, I did my job first semester. And I found it's a lot better you get those first semester grades. It's so much easier to keep your grade point up than it is to bring it, you know, or to keep it where it's at instead of, you know, having to come back from a one point or a point something something, you know, because, you know, you think it's going to let up second semester after the season's over, but it just doesn't. And, you know, I, and that, that's the way I proceeded when I was coming up here. Okay. Alexis, it helps to talk a little bit more about your perspective, what you see and uh, your personal experiences, if you may, about the interracial relationships in the community. Uh, the public's perception and attitudes of black students or black student athletes. Could you share something with us on, on that line? Well, um, when I came here, like I said, I came from an all-white school, so I didn't really see. When I came here, I didn't look at everything as being black, white, black, white, which it is, <laughs> definitely, because I had all-white friends, and so when I came here, I had more problems adjusting to being around blacks all the time, which you're forced to do at Iowa State. It's like the blacks hang around each other and the whites hang around each other. That's ridiculous, you know, I mean, I don't know, I guess a lot of black people think that, um, that you need this unity, which is true, it's great, you know, you do need the unity, but it separates you even more from the university, you know, and like Troy was saying, people need to be integrated more, and um, I think that if people didn't separate themselves, and try and stick within a group where they're comfortable in and try and integrate within everyone that it w they would see someone else 
it's someone else's perception and maybe it would be just a little bit easier you know because like Hugh said when you're picking your friends you know if you pick someone that's going out all the time you're going to be going out all the time but if you pick someone you know that's studying and stuff and is making it and is succeeding then maybe some of their habits will rub off on you. Mm -hmm. oh. Hugh you your makeup and you six foot tall or so or better mm -hmm. uh, you, your body is lean and strong you look like an athlete uh, when you walk into a store downtown or at the mall, what feelings, what's your perception uh, of that environment or when you, any place with friends, et cetera, in any of the eateries? Well, I'll, I'll say now, if, if you do walk into a, let's say a mall, let's say you walk, walk into Yonkers or a department store or something, and if there's more than one or two of you, you're going to be watched. You're definitely going to be watched. The, the little person may come, may follow you. Until you until you're out of the store, and that's you know you know on a couple of occasions I turn around and say listen I got enough money to buy the store, <laughs> you know just uh, you know leave me alone or you know I may not have said it like that but I definitely got the message across that you know I didn't want to be bothered, but you got you have to realize that you are in a fishbowl, you are gonna you somebody's always watching you, I don't care what you do, it's gonna be blown up, if you if you run a stoplight and get a ticket it, it's gonna be in the paper. You have to realize that whatever you do is front page news. I don't care how little it was. I don't care if you did it in high school, but you can't do it here. You know, and you, you just have to understand that. And two, I want to uh, mention something that Troy was talking about, and he, he, he mentioned cultural awareness. And I think that is, I don't want to say a solution, but it's a, some, a step in the right direction. We need to, uh, to learn about each other's culture. If we can do that in some sort of orientation if it's just the orientation for everybody and and maybe have a something like a, a visa but have it in the in the fall and have an in an orientation style where we get to you know have booths or something set up for each different cultures whether we have an international student